I pledge allegiance to Yahweh Almighty, who has blessed the Constitutional Republic of the United States, and to that republic for which those gorgeous red, white, and blue stars and stripes stand, one nation under our only God, Yahweh, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, who does she think she is changing our Pledge of Allegiance? Well, please know that it's been changed before. President Eisenhower just happened to add the under God phrase. Before then, it had nothing about God, and it was taught in our public schools, and our children, whose parents allowed them to go to public school, were told to raise their right hand in a Hail Hitler type sign and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, I guess our President Eisenhower got a little conviction about him and he added the under God. The only problem that I have is I pledge my allegiance to Yahweh Almighty who has allowed me to be able to live in this country for which that flag represents. And I'm about as patriotic as you can get, except for the things that go on within our nation that should not be allowed to be forced upon our children by the government and public schools. Um, we should make stands as parents for this. And if you choose to send your children to public schools, Mom, by the way, this is a women's program, you certainly have a free will to choose. You have a right to choose where you send your children to school. You have the right to uh, set your eye gate and your ear gate on whatever you choose to listen to and watch. Um, you have the right uh, to choose the God of your choice, uh, a Satan, satanic type uh, uh, spirit that... Uh, encourages you to do lewdness or you can choose the almighty Yahweh that would give you his spirit to keep you and protect you and direct you in the ways of righteousness for his namesake so we indeed have a right to choose again our pledge of allegiance um, is to our God who gave us breath to be able to have the privilege to live in a beautiful nation to live in a land that's been far freer than any other nation. And with this said, I want to talk about free will a little bit. I have a very unusual, <laughs> I have very unusual subject matter here. Um, we have the free will to have fun, to have fun, <laughs> or we have the free will to be set apart and be worms. <laughs> Yeah, you heard me right. We have the free will to have fun. And we also have the free will to be set apart and be a worm. <laughs> now, I know that sounds strange. And um, let's get into this a little bit. I've been doing uh, word etymology studies. And uh, let's take a look at free will. Of course, we know pretty much what that is. You know, Yahweh Almighty gives us a soul. And we have free will to choose. He does not want robot service. He does not. Um, he does give us um, commandments that instructs us. And we have the right to obey them or not obey them. So we can study to know the truth. Or we can just believe what somebody else has taught us and run with it, right? Right. That's what most people do. They teach only what they've been taught without serious study. Most people just read and don't study. And they think because somebody's just a good old Joe, you know, they're going to follow them. And, oh, they do, such, they do such good works and they have love. Look, that love message is killing the assembly. Because they fall in love with the wrong stuff. In fact, okay, the first commandment gives us a little bit of instruction. And the first commandment that you women see is you shall have no other gods before me. Well, who is the me? You got to go to the previous verse to find out what who the me is. And you'll find that the previous verse says, I am Yahweh, your God. You shall have no other gods before me. 
Now, in the English KJV, you will find an uppercase L-O-R-D, written in all uppercase letters. In the complete Jewish Bible, you will find an uppercase Adonai, written in all uppercase letters. These uppercase titles have replaced the name of Yahweh in your scriptures. Who had the right to do that? Who had the right to tell you that you cannot say his name? Who had the right to tell you that? Now, the excuse given for that, or I should say the reasoning, because I don't want to be disrespectful in how people look at things, but it's incorrect. Um, they, they said that the reasoning for not speaking his name is um, uh, not to take his name for nothing. Uh, we don't take his name in vain. We don't take his name for, for nothing. Well, there are far more, many other verses that use exhort, proclaim, say, speak, cry out, mention. It all goes with his name. And they spoke his name. They cried out his name in the scriptures. They, they did this continually. It's all through. They declared his name all through the word. It's not against scripture to speak his word. Now, we don't speak it idly. We don't speak it for nothing. We speak it for something. We, we speak it to let people know, hey, the name of your God is Yahweh, and it did not change. And the phrase that's going to stand as a witness or testimony for or against the many is hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise, and Yah is the short poetic form of Yahweh found in Psalm 68, 4. So we have a free will to choose. By the way, this is the women's program. So I speak to you women, and if you guys listen, that's between you and the Holy One of Israel. So this free will gives us a right to choose the God of your choice, the um, uh, school of your choice for your children that teaches them perversion or filth, or perhaps, Mom, maybe you should teach them at home and learn uh, to teach them, learn yourself to teach them to fear the Almighty Yahweh. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of Yahweh. Knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of His Word should be first and foremost in priority. Again, we have a right to choose. So... We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, right? And if your children are not hearing the word within your household and watching a close, tight-knit relationship between you and the Holy One of Israel, how do you expect your children to behave themselves? Now, I know that at a certain age that they have, uh, they're going to do what they want to do. They're going to get away from mom and dad and they're just going to do what they want to do. But while they're living under your roof, mom... You are the keeper of your household. And by the way, that word keep means to guard. Number one, you are guarding your own soul, but you are in charge of guarding your child's soul. Your child's soul. Notice I didn't say kid. A kid is a goat. We do not want our children having a goat spirit. Oh, I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm just goating. <laughs> I'm speaking words that I've been looking up, studying etymology, the etymology behind these words and where they come from. And our language, <laughs> our language is a mess. And uh, we only know what we've been taught, what our parents taught us. Again, we have free will to choose. But our free will, Mom, is to teach our children the fear and admonition of the one who gave us breath. That's a privilege to be able to teach your children that. And they have a right to choose when they get older. But when they're under your jurisdiction in your home, your home is supposed to be the sanctuary of the living Yahweh Almighty. And he is to be honored and revered within your home in all manner of conversation, and that conversation is not what comes out of your mouth alone. It's your everyday lifestyle. I have to say that our children were blessed to be able to um, hear somebody praying day or night in this household since the day they were born. 
and in their mama, me, in their belly, in my belly. Because we are staunch believers in keeping a tight relationship in prayer. We keep the communication lines open. We keep the communication lines open. We have free will to do that. We want to do that. That's our, We thrive. This is our life and our breath. This is our free will. This is what we choose to do. But I'm not to infringe on your free will. However, according to Scripture, the prophet was told to warn the people of their transgression. He was warned to tell them. He was to tell them, and if he told them, then their blood would be on their own head if he told them. But if he failed to tell them, their blood would be on his head. So as an aged woman, I share with you truth to warn you of your position in your household as keeper at home. Keep does not just mean cook and clean, all right? It does not just mean uh, as a wife that you, you know, get under subjection and obey your husband. Of course, we know you're to do that. Your husband should get the last word in your home. You should have respect for your husband with your children. And if you fail to and you get out of line, like I did in my young and dumb years, I go make it right with my husband and ask him to forgive me. And I, I'll ask my children to forgive me. If, if I've transgressed in their side, if I've lost my as spirit or attitude or anything, I've always tried to humble myself in my older years. I was kind of young and dumb at one time, and I didn't always do the right thing. And um, I had the Holy Spirit almost two years before I married. But we live and learn, don't we? So I have a free will to choose. I can choose to be submissive to the word of Yahweh because I love him. And I choose to be obedient to my husband because I love him. But I love Yahweh first. And because I love Yahweh first, I want to obey his word with a circumcised heart. I have the free will to do that. I have the free will to abstain from the very appearance of evil. And you have the same free will. You can choose the same thing, or you can choose to participate in evil. Well, every man is righteous in his own eyes, but women are as well. I'm not teaching the men, I'm teaching the women. Women have a right to choose. You have the right to choose what you do to your body. And if you choose to kill an unborn child, it's not a blob They've labeled it a fetus that sounds like some kind of foreign object, but it's a child in your womb. Do the right thing. Have that baby. Don't let people abort that baby and take its body parts and sell them. All right. So we have free will to choose. We can choose to be carnal and foolish and tell jokes and foolish jesting, we can choose to do this. We can choose to have fun. <laughs> you know, I always hear people say, well, let's, you know, that's fun. Oh, that was funny. Or they use this word all the time. And I thought, I wonder where that word comes from. I'm 60, I, I was, okay, I'm 69 now, but I was, a couple years ago, I thought, you know, I've never looked up that word funny. What does that mean? <laughs> You'll be shocked. And I try not to use it anymore. And sometimes I catch myself because it's a matter of habit. But listen to the word fun as a noun. This word fun as a noun means, now we're talking about free will. What you can choose to do. You have free will to have fun and do what you want to do. Or you can choose to be set apart and be a worm. <laughs> we're going to get to all of this. It's such a good study. All right, the word fun. It means diversion, amusement, Mirthful sport, it gets into, uh, uh, before 1727, it means a cheat or a trick. And in 1700, it meant it was a verb to cheat or hoax, which is of uncertain origin, probably a variant of Middle English um, foolishness, like be fool. That's what this word fun comes from. You ever heard of funny money? 
counterfeit bills. That's not fun. That's something mean. That's something wicked. That's something unholy. That's where the word fun was. Okay, and then in, uh, it says fun and games or mirthful carrying on, and that's from 1906. But basically, the word fun is not a good word. Oh, well, we, we use it for what, what's, what we don't mean any harm in it. Well, I'm just saying, just like the word understand, stand under. Do you stand under someone? Or maybe we should say, we comprehend what you're saying. All right, so the word fun as a verb in the 1680s meant to cheat. In 1833, it went to make fun or jest or joke. And we know what the word says about that. It says foolish jesting. Our, our answer should be yay or nay. And foolish jesting is not convenient. It's not convenient for us. We're not supposed to be doing that. Then fun is an adjective. In the mid-15th century, meant foolish or silly. And then uh, from 1846 on, it meant enjoyable. So it just kind of evolved, but it started off as something bad. The root of it was something bad. Okay, and there's a, okay this word funny as an adjective. Okay, it means, we think it means humorous. In 1756, it comes from the word fun, meaning strange or odd or causing perplexity. And then by 1806, it was said to be um, like a Southern, uh, uh, marked as, a, um, as something from the South that says, uh, the two senses of the word led to the retort question, funny, ha-ha, or funny, peculiar, which is attested by 1916, 1916 related to funnier or funniest or funny farm, which is a mental hospital. <laughs> it's a slang from 1962, or the funny bone, the elbow of the humorous. You go hitting your funny bone, it's not funny. It doesn't feel good. So this word fun and funny is totally blown out of proportion. But you have a free will uh, to act foolish. You have a free will, but the scripture tells uh, that the women, especially the aged women, to be sober-minded. That sober-minded is not foolish. It's not crazy. It doesn't uh, behave itself unseemly. It's, which brings us to set apart. We have the free will to either be fun or funny or stupid or foolish or disobedient. Or we can have the free will to be a set-apart worm. <laughs> what is she talking about? I'm getting to that. Hey, it's good. All right, set-apart. Psalm, uh, Psalm 4 and 4 says, Understand that Yahweh, I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible, by the way, understand that Yahweh sets apart the godly person for himself. Yahweh will hear when I call to him. So we want the free will to be godly, to be righteous. We wear his righteousness to be obedient. Well, you know we got to sin a little bit. No, you don't. No, you don't. You choose to be sinful. You choose to be a transgressor. You choose to do ugliness. You choose to speak ugly. And some people are so potty mouth, they need to uh, throw in that F-bomb word around. They need a whole roll of toilet paper just to wipe their mouth uh, from all the things that they say in less than five minutes. That's a shame and a disgrace. It really, if you would hear, listen to yourself, you think it makes you sound big and tough. Well, look, it really makes you sound ugly and totally disrespectful. Who respects something like that? No one. Who respects someone who cannot speak uh, in proper language, something of etiquette, and still make the point in sternness and, um, and speak in a decent tone of voice without cursing? My, my. How'd I get there? We're talking about set apart. Set apart worm. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get to the worm part in a minute. But this meaning of set apart from this Psalm uh, 4 and 4, um, it says, it's the uh, Hebrew word palal. And it means to be distinct, marked out, to be separated, 
be distinguished, to be distinct, and it repeats itself to be separated or distinguished. It says to be wonderful, but it also, um, uh, meaning of separated. All right, we know what separate means, right? But this breaks down separate, separated, a little bit differently from the Hebrew, the Hebrew word badal. And it means to divide or separate. Uh, it repeats it again, to sever, to separate, to set apart, to make distinction or a difference, to divide into parts, to separate oneself from, to withdraw from, to separate oneself unto, or to be separated, to be excluded, to be set apart. In other words, Yahweh Almighty expects us to, to withdraw and to be excluded or severed from anything or anyone that would cause us to be drawn away from him. Um, I've had to make some choices over the years, over um, these, um, going into 49 years of having the Holy Spirit, 39 years, knowing that my God's name is Yahweh and my Savior is Yahweh. And uh, it's been difficult, it's been difficult decisions. And um, I haven't meant to hurt anyone, but when you find yourself laughing at filthiness and shadiness, you know, Yahweh has no gray areas. His, air, his, his word is light, and it shines light. And yes, human beings make mistakes, but not willful. Not willful things. You know, human beings can be asleep because we see the uh, parable of the, uh, the five wise virgins and the five foolish. They were all asleep. But the wise ones took extra oil. And I've seen people that uh, have been asleep that have made horrible decisions. And they compromised what they stood for, what they believed. And from the way I understand it, um, the compromise is going on to the point that it's okay. And people are proud to be a great grandparent of someone who has um, inadvertently had a child out of wedlock. This is not a, something to be proud of. This is a shameful thing. Of course, you're not going to mistreat the child. You're not going to mis mistreat the uh, the girl that uh, that is having this child out of wedlock. You're not going to mistreat anyone. But at the same time, you're not going to have parties for people that don't do things the right way. Yes, we have mercy and show mercy, but we don't give parties for people that have done the wrong thing. We see about them. We nurture them. But what they did was wrong, and we don't brag about it. We don't brag about these things. We don't compromise the word. We choose, look, people say, oh, you think you're better than somebody else? No, I might be better off if I, if I, if I separate myself because I don't want to find myself being laxadaisia when thinking things are all right, that this is okay to, to be promiscuous like this. It is not all right. It is sin. It is transgression. It is transgression to do a lot of things. And, of course, you allow people the young people especially you know uh they have young people have youthful lusts but when you're an aged woman or an uh, i'm not going to speak about the men if you're an aged woman you're supposed to be sober-minded you're not supposed to be dressing poured into your clothes to where you can and and your shirts are so tight you can see all the bumps and everything on on your on your chest um, your, your skirts are not supposed to be so tight and have a split where you can see all the way up your dress just because your dress is long. Um, there's a lot of things a woman can dress. Look, I've, I've seen, um, in fact, uh, there's uh, young girls that dress the part, but they're laying with young boys. Um, there, the scripture says it is good for a man not to touch a woman. I can attest to the fact that my husband and I, when we dated, we went with a chaperone. We did not kiss. We did not even hold hands until the night we were married. And it can be done. I've only known of one other couple that did that. One other couple that did that. And if we didn't have a chaperone, he went in his vehicle and I went in mine. And there were lots of people there when we got there. Now, since I've been older, I've gone to dinner with men, but they stayed on their side of the vehicle and I stayed on my side of the vehicle. Understand? Stand under? Comprehend? <laughs> We're talking about set apart. Set apart. 
Humans have a right to choose. You women have a right to choose to be whatever and do whatever you want to do. But I have a right. I have a right to withdraw and separate, not to hurt you willfully, but I don't want to get myself caught up to where I get seared and think that things are all right to do and try to overlook it. I don't want to overlook anything, not with my own children, not with your children or anybody else's children. I won't do it. If y'all would keep me and help me and cover me by his blood, that I don't open up my ear gate and my eye gate to the wrong things. I'm so thankful my husband made a vow not to have a hell of vision in our home. I'm so thankful. And it's been going into 49 years. Now, I look at things um, in, uh, on the uh, computer but it's not, it's not the crazy carnal things that's going to, uh, it's mostly news, so I know how to pray. I know how to pray with news. And I don't watch a lot of this filth and perversion that's exposing all these child traffickers. Once I know about it, I don't get into their gory detail of filth. I don't need to go there. The scripture doesn't even do that. Scripture doesn't even do that. Yahweh just makes a blatant statement that there were children offered in the fire. They were offered a sacrifice in the fire. He doesn't get into all the nitty-gritty detail what happened. And there was only one king that I read about that repented of that. We're talking about being set apart. So what's a worm? <laughs> all right, in this worm study, the word worm is found 13 times in the KJV and 10 times in the complete Jewish Bible. Now, I've been listening to my, I listen to my audio CDs over and over and over again. And one Shabbat, I was listening about the worm, and there was a... Uh, verse that stood out to me you know what in isaiah 41 and 14 where it says have no fear yaakov or jacob you worm you men of israel i will help you says yahweh your redeemer is the holy one of israel that's isaiah 41 14 so i thought worm yahweh called jacob or yaakov a worm and i thought hmm so i looked up the word worm all right it says there's two different hebrew words for worm there's one called Tola, and it is just what it says. It's a worm, scarlet stuff, crimson. It gets into a worm, the female, and then it gets into uh, maggot and grub worms. And uh, then it's, okay, so that's the uh, Hebrew word for the worm uh, in Isaiah 41 and 14. The next word for worm is the following, and it's just simply a maggot, like you see, you know, uh, just a just a nasty old worm, <laughs> but there's a root word for that maggot worm. There's a root word, and this is what I thought was so interesting. The root word for the worm, okay, for the um, for the Hebrew that means a maggot worm is nima. No, excuse me, rima, rima, r i m m a. Okay, it's resh mem and hay. Okay, so Rama is a maggot worm. But the root word of this, now this is so cool. The root word of the, of the maggot word is Ramam. And it means to be exalted, be lifted up, to be exalted. It repeats itself, to lift oneself. And I thought this word was so interesting because of the scripture verse where Yahweh called Jacob a, a worm. <laughs> so we can see that a worm is a very base creature. Yet Yahweh called Jacob a worm, but we see that he states that he will help Jacob. And the verse following the 14th verse reads like this. So this is Isaiah 41, 15. He said, I will make you, now he calls him a worm. He says, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new with sharp pointed teeth to thresh the mountains and crush them to dust to reduce the hills to chaff. As you fan them, the wind will carry them off, and the whirlwind will scatter them. Then you will rejoice in Yahweh, you, uh, you will uh, glory in the Holy One of Israel. In other words, Yaakov, we can be worms, but Yahweh promises to help us. Now look, a worm has no eyes, a worm doesn't have limbs, and a worm doesn't have a backbone. 
So Almighty Yah will call Jacob a worm with no eyes, no limbs, or a backbone. Yet Yaakov, or his name was changed to Israel, totally trusted Yahweh in her youth. And, and Israel trusted Yahweh in her tender years, having no eyes, limbs, or a backbone. Is this not how we're supposed to be, worms? <laughs> so although worms might be disgusting to some, the benefits of worms can be quite beneficial. For example, worms and soil can keep, it, uh, keep the dirt fine and seeds will grow easily. There's a lot of good things about worms. So we're to break up our fallow ground and uh, we let our hearts take root. And um, in this vessel of clay, we just don't let it get hard. So we need to be from our own free will, a worm for Yahweh. <laughs> Until next time, Shalom.